I was fascinated by that idea. I thought that well, music doesn't necessarily have to be associated with the emotion of love or happiness or sadness. It could be this completely other realm, this surreal environment that you know, take you to a completely different place, some place that may not even exist in the real world. Music can be like Salvador Dali. It doesn't always have to be. It doesn't always have to be structured the same way. Things can be obscured and offset and mutated. Remember studying Stockhausen's contact record. I remember getting that record, tripping on acid, just being completely perplexed listening on my parents' record player to this record over and over, thinking how demented is this person. It made me question everything about music, what music even is, the structure of music. Does it even have to have the melodies? Does there even need to be a rhythm? I love that. I love any kind of music or artist that made me question all, any of those ideas of what even could be a music composition. Initially, I think it was all by accident. It was my mom. She got me involved with uh, piano lessons, probably around the age of seven or eight. She got me and my brother involved in it, and we were, at that time, at that age, it was not something we were interested in doing. We wanted to play in the creek and catch poisonous snakes and ride BMX bikes and skateboard, you know. I was like my last piano teacher. He asked me like one profound question. He was like, you know, you've been playing piano. Does it bring you any enjoyment? Where's your mom just making you do this? I was like, yeah, my mom's just making me do this. He's like, this isn't the reason why you should be playing music. And I sat there and I was honestly perplexed by that sentence when he said, you should be playing because you enjoy this. All my teachers prior to that were just teaching technique, teaching to read and to play properly, but none of them were getting really to what the root of the most important thing is, is the emotional connection to the music. What are you emotionally feeling from the music? And I'll never forget that. So me and my brother were skateboarders, and along with skateboard culture came the music, DIY punk music. Everything from like Dead Kennedys to Minor Threat, Misfits, DRI, those, those type of bands, and then uh, then there was a lot of hip hop too, because a lot of my skateboarder friends were listening to a lot of early EPMD, like Public Enemy was a big one for us, Eric B. Rakim. You know, late, late 80s, early 90s hip hop stuff was also infused in that. So we were influenced by a lot of that music. And then when industrial music emerged, it was kind of like taking both of those, the synthetic sounds and, of hip hop with the raw edginess of punk music and kind of making this new, sort of thing that was happening. That really, really sparked my attention. I would go to this record shop in Atlanta called the Let the Music Play, and I would actually go in the reject bin. They had a, a bin of records where all the DJs that wouldn't play these records because it didn't fit the most popular current styles. I would go in every Friday and I would buy all the stuff that was way too dangerous to play on a dance floor. It was too weird or, or it was ordered by accident. I found so many great records in that bin that were you know, some of the strangest music that I'd ever heard. And it really opened my mind up to a whole new world of electronic music that wasn't necessarily just designed to be played in a club. Some of this music was just like, hey, take a bunch of drugs and see where it takes you on a journey, you know? Yeah, I think the first drum machine I had was an HR 16 bit, HR 16, crappy old drum machine, but it taught me the basics, programming and arranging songs. And then from there, I got a TR-909 drum machine. I learned a lot on that drum machine. I guess the Roland 909 was where I started sequencing and arranging songs. And, and a lot of the music I was listening to at the time was using the TR-909 drum machine as a basis for the groundwork for the rhythm. It was a perfect first machine to learn on. 
And from that point, you know, I mentioned the rave movement happened. So I started going to a lot of parties and was influenced by a lot of the early sort of like Midwest sound, sounds of Detroit, techno, electro, people like Juan Atkins, Model 500, and Drexia. So that began my journey into more experimental music. So I found composers in the academic realm, electroacoustic composers, people doing experimental noise, to field recordings, and I discovered that you know, sound wasn't just a band or a person playing one instrument. It could be someone recording EVP recordings of people, of dead people. Who, who knows? I mean, it could be your perception of what, what music is. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was cataloging and recording a lot of sounds back, you know, in the late 90s. I was using portable DAT recorders, digital audio tape, and then eventually I moved over to mini disc recorders, which were these portable kind of mini CDs. The newer generations probably have no idea what those mediums were. But I used to go out and record with these using little stereo T microphones and stuff. So I would record insects, ambiences, machinery, all kinds of stuff. And I would catalog these sounds and then I would put them in my sampler and then use them in music compositions. The term back then, sound designer, that wasn't even a term back in the, in the early 90s, um, mid 90s when I was capturing all these sounds and using them. I didn't realize that I was training my ears to listen for things when I was like, oh, that sound, if I could take that sound and pitch it down, you know, like an octave or two octaves, it'll turn, make the sound larger than life and turn it into something completely different. Your ears start clinging on to things and then it's almost like they're pieces of a Lego or a puzzle. You're like, oh, this one will be perfect for here. This piece will be great for this part in the composition and this will make great transition point, you start looking at, thinking about sound completely differently. You know, sounds that people don't even pay attention to that happen, you know, every day in the outside world. I started to pay attention a lot more and I didn't realize that all of those skills would later play a huge part in me working as a sound designer and using those type of sounds, applying them to film and video games and, and various other media which required that exact skill of taking found and foley sounds and then incorporating them into a TV commercial. I worked with many advertising agencies where I was scoring to picture just sound design, you know, like car commercial where I had to go out and record a whole car or a, some product where we had to go out and capture stuff out in the field. And it was the same idea. You're just taking it and telling a story. You're telling a story with sounds scored to a picture. The journey actually also happened by accident. <laughs> I was approached by a company, Native Instruments. They approached me in 1999 or 98 about working on some sample libraries for them and programming. And I'd never worked with the company before other than just making sounds for my own productions. And at the time, they were a very small company. There were only six people working at NI at the time. I remember visiting their office in Berlin. I was like, oh, these guys are cool. They're making this interesting software called Generator. At the time, they were like this underground software company making really innovative, interesting tools that were for people like me that wanted to really kind of manipulate sound in ways that I've never been able to do before. So I was like, oh, I'd love, love to work with you guys. And that began this long relationship. At the first computer wave, when people started making a lot of music in the computers and there's a lot, the software revolution happened, VST instruments happened, and they released their, I think it was the Hammond B3 and the Pro 53, which were the two first most realistic kind of emulations of real hardware instruments. And that took everyone by storm. That was kind of the first time when everyone was like, oh wow, the computer actually can be a very sophisticated instrument and everyone started to really take it seriously at that point. And then that really kind of kick-started things. And then other companies started getting involved. And then I started working with them on their sample library department with like Contact and Battery. And then they started divisioning out to synthesizers like Absinthe, FM7, Massive. And so I was asked to work and design sounds for some of these first uh, synthesis uh, platforms. That really just was the beginning of it. And then I had no idea that their software was gonna end up in these commercial studios all over the world. Film studios, gaming studios, commercial houses, you name it. People were buying this software. And of course, every time you open up one of their applications, the first thing that comes up is all the programmers that created the software. And then the sound designers who created the presets were always listed in the credit. I was getting calls all the time like, hey, 
we heard your presets that you did for Absinthe or this, this. We'd love to work with you. And then before you know it, companies like Clavia Nord and Korg and Roland and a lot of the major keyboard manufacturing companies started to jump on and were asking me to work doing sounds for them at that point. Yeah, it came full circle. If you would have told me that, you know, 15 years down the road that I'd actually be making sounds for the companies that I started first buying, somebody would have laughed. It was, I never would have dreamed that I'd be doing what I'm doing now, but that's what my job is today, you know? When I was, even when I was in college, I always thought I was just gonna get a normal job and do music as a hobby, but that never happened. It just, my music career just kept staying in the fast lane and never let me out of the fast lane. So I just said, hey, I guess I just have to keep driving this car and see where it goes. And it's been a really fun journey since that point. searching out new companies that are pushing things or trying something different, whether that's an instrument or processing effect or a piece of software, it doesn't matter. I'm, I don't care what format it is, but if they're trying to do something that's new, that hasn't been done before, that's unique, that brings something new to the table, that always catches my attention or my ear. And I'm always constantly looking for any kind of tools that can bring me really, really unique results very quickly. Funny enough, I found out about the Game Changer Audio stuff through a friend of mine my friend Brian, who um, is also a well-known composer, sound designer, and he uh, pulled me aside at NAMM and said, hey, you got to come check this. Your mind's going to get blown away. You've never heard anything like this. And I got a demo of the Plus pedal. It's almost like the Spectral FFT sustaining pedal. I'd never heard anything like it. And I'm a huge fan of FFT Spectral freezing, but I always was doing it in the computer. It was really CPU intensive, and the results were always Okay, sometimes and sometimes not, but then when I heard that pedal, uh, it really blew my mind away. I was like, wow, these guys are onto something. Um, and then being able to freeze a layer and then add another layer on top of that, impose another layer. And I was just amazed at the quality of the sound. First of all, it blew me away, then just how easy it was to do something that was, for me in the past, extremely a, a very complex thing to do in the DSP realm now is just one sustain hold away and a really nice form factor with a pedal. And then that's what eventually led me to look at some of the other products you guys had, going from there from the Plasma pedal and module collaboration with Erica Sense, because I'm also a big fan of the Erica Sense modules. You guys are thinking outside the box. You're not just trying to reinvent something that's already been done, um, which a lot of pedal companies and instrument companies are just trying to follow the current craze like, oh, Everyone liked this instrument 20 years ago. Let's do the new version of that. And you guys aren't doing that. You guys are trying to do really unique new things, which um, I really respect. And I, I really respect companies that, are, that take a gamble, you know, throw the dice out and say, hey, you know what? We're not gonna reinvent the wheel. We're gonna go, we're gonna design a whole completely new concept and see what happens. You're really trying to do some new things that haven't been done before and doing them in a very unique way where everything is perfect. The aesthetics are very nice. The, the auditory effect of what's happening is really interesting as well. It's, it's hard to find a company where all of those elements are, are just, it's the perfect mixture of all that together that creates this really unique thing that inspires you to want to do stuff with it. That's hard to find. So that's what really drew me to you guys, that creative spark. That's really where it began with me and you guys.